Hey y'all, Coach Unify here, talking about the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, that is an extremely important day when it comes to the Feast of Tabernacles. In this video, what we're going to be talking about is some specific verses related to the eighth day celebration. We're going to be looking in the book of Nehemiah, Second Chronicles, and First Kings as we talk about some of the events that happened on the eighth day. But before we jump over there and look at those Old Testament verses, I wanted to show you this one particularly out of the New Testament of the Bible. And that's over in 1 John and chapter 7, verse 37. This is talking about when the Messiah actually attended the Feast of Tabernacles. And I believe it's important to bring out how the Messiah actually kept the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, there, there are the people who teach what I call the doctrine of liberty. Um, these are ministers who, you know, fit the characteristics of what you read about over there in Jeremiah chapter 14, verses 15 and 16. Um, but they, they say that you don't have to worry about keeping the, the commandments of the Bible because the Messiah did away with them or whatever. But, you know, when you look back at, you know, the example that the Messiah left for us, he actually kept all of the feast days, including the post-exilic feast days like Hanukkah and Purim. So I'm not sure how they are forgetting about Matthew chapter 5 when the Messiah said he didn't come to do, do away with the law. He came to fulfill the law, meaning he was giving us an example of what it means to actually walk in the law. But anyway, we'll let those guys sort that out. I mean, they're not planning on surviving the tribulation anyway. And like Revelation says, let the wicked stay wicked. Let's look at John chapter 7, verse 37. It says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Now, this is actually talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. You can see that if you go up further in the story, how the Messiah actually appeared to them in the middle of the uh, Feast of Tabernacles and started teaching those guys there. Um, well, here you have it at the end of the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, and he's going to give, you know, a few short words here. Let me, let me read what it says. It says, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So this is, you know, the part of the story where he's talking about this, this living water. And but you the point is, is that this actually took place during the eighth day of the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. And you see right there, verse uh, 37, it says the last great day of the feasts. Now, of course, these feast days are kind of like dress rehearsals. I mean, there's coming a prophetic fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, and it will be more on a day for year scale than a day for day scale. Um, we talk about that in several of our classes as we you know, talk about how we are actually in the 10 days of awe, uh, which is actually 10 years of awe that started back there in the year 2016 right after that blood moon tetrad in 2014 and 2015 that was indicating the uh, 10 years of tribulation or the 10 days of awe when the uh, children of the most high who have been committing unintentional sins have the opportunity to correct themselves and start to get back into the law we'll find out you know here in some of the uh, verses that we'll talk about how it is extremely important for those who love the Lord and, you know, planning to walk in his graces or whatever that they actually um, find and obey the law. Well, we understand that here and now, the time period that we live in, we're actually being given 10 years from 2015 to about 2025. And we're given 10 years to learn how to keep the feast days and how to keep the law, which is Exodus chapter 20 through chapter 24, verse 7. You read about this and all of the statutes over there in the book of Leviticus and chapter 23, right there in verse 39. At the end of verse 39, you see how it's talking about the eighth day and how it shall be a Sabbath day. 
it is a seven day feast. Um, the Feast of Tabernacles is just more importance. I shouldn't say more importance, but there's significant importance placed on the eighth day. While we're over here in Leviticus 23, let me show you something I found really interesting up there when it's talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, that is also a mandatory festival that lasts for one week is exactly six months apart, which is really interesting. You think about how you have a, a seven day celebration in the spring and then exactly six months later you have a seven day um, festival uh, that starts in the fall. But let me show you something else that, you know, it's probably more than coincidence. And that's how you see it talking about a eighth day celebration there during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You see, it starts to talk about it right there in verse 10 when it says, um, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you come into the land which I give unto you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest unto the priest. So this was a first fruit celebration. Um, but then when we come down uh, to um, about verse 14 or 15, it tells them, you know, more specifically when it is that they are supposed to have this first fruit celebration. And we see that it is actually on the eighth day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's just like uh, when we're talking about tabernacles and how you'll have the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles on the day after the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which the seventh day would have been a Sabbath day, then you have this eighth day celebration, which is of significant importance. Well, you see the same thing occurring back there during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where you've gone through a week-long festival um, ending on the seventh day, which would, would have been a Sabbath day, but then on the eighth day, the day after the Sabbath day, you see the Feast of First Fruits, which was a it had its own significant importance. Well, let me take you back over to the book of John and this time in chapter 20, when it's talking uh, about the resurrection of the Messiah. You see that it was during the Feast of First Fruits when he actually appeared to the disciples there. This would have been the eighth day celebration in the spring. You see, uh, let me read verse 26. It says, and after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas and with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Now, this is the time when, you know, of course, you see there in verse 27, how he told um uh, no, doubting Thomas to put his fingers inside his wounds, inside the uh, wounds of his of his hands and in the wounds of his feet and probably in the wounds of his uh, um, side there that he suffered on the day that he was killed. Well, here you, it is eight days later on or during the Feast of First Fruits when all of this transpired. So let's jump over here and let's look in the book of Nehemiah in chapter eight. This is um, verse 17 is one of the verses that talks about uh, the events that took place uh, during the eighth day of the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Now, just to give you a little background on what's going on here, um, it was during this time, if you read up in, in, in this earlier in this chapter and even in the previous chapter, you'll see that the people had found the law of the Lord. It's like the children of Israel, you know, they were in Jerusalem. I guess they were doing their own thing. And then, you know, somebody went and searched through the temple and found the law found that covenant that was given to Moses on Mount Horb. We can read about that covenant in Exodus chapter 20 through 24 verse 7. But if you remember the history of, of Israel, one of the things you hear about, you know, those guys and what they went through is how they would always have a period of blessing where things were going really, really well for them. And then things would turn south and they would get enslaved. They would get persecuted and bad things would happen. Well, what was actually going on 
there was their obedience to the covenant, their obedience to that contract that we have on us that, you know, was made between our spirit man and our heavenly father. Well, when things would be bad for them was when they was actually separated from the law, the kings and the priests, and nobody was actually paying attention to the statutes and commandments and stuff that they were supposed to be doing. And of course, you know, the way it works is when we step away from those commandments, it actually creates sin in our life. Remember the definition given to us in the New Testament is that sin is actually the transgression of the law. So when we start breaking those commandments and those statutes, we enter us enter a stint a sin state and when we're in sin what that does is kind of blocks out our conscience and makes it to where we can't hear our conscience well what we learn here now is that our that voice that we're hearing from our conscience is actually the voice of our father it is him who is talking to us by way of our conscience that's like the communication point between he and us that's how of course we use our, our thoughts or whatever to pray but when he wants to talk back to us he uses our conscience well when we commit sin we quiet down or shut down that conscience as if we're throwing a wet blanket on it kind of smother it out and so that's what was happening to those guys when they would lose focus on the commandments. They would actually lose the voice of God. They would lose their guidance. And then, of course, Satan would be allowed to have his way with them. And he would drive them into persecutions and drive them into slavery, drive them into slaughterings and all kinds of bad stuff would happen to those people. So here we are up in Nehemiah. Now, of course, Nehemiah, along with Ezra, were two of the key players when it comes to uh, building the second temple, that temple that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. You read over there in uh, like Second Kings, chapter 25, how he went in and raped and pillaged and, you know, took all of the gold and silver out and, of Jerusalem and, you know, took it into Babylon or whatever. But here, this is the time after King Cyrus and Artaxerxes and King Darius who all made decrees in order to rebuild the temple well here you have during the time when they actually started constructing that second temple and they have found the law and are starting to dedicate that second temple and they're doing so by way of you know some of the things that they've read about in the law now this is all important for us this is actually extremely important stuff when you think that the same thing is actually going on by way of the third temple this third temple that is supposed to be built on the hearts of humanity is now in a construction state It's being built now and a lot of what you see and all seeing going on in the world, you know, with people reporting um, um, of great awakening type stuff. You know, there's a lot of people who are talking about intuition, all of these dreams that people are having. That's another way that our father speaks to us. He speaks to us through intuition, through dreams and through the conscious. Well, you see all of it. You see a great increase in this stuff, you know, taking place now, even before, you know, all of humanity goes through this great awakening. It is because people are finding the law. They're becoming obedient to those commandments, those statutes and those judgments that you read about over there in um, Exodus chapter 20 through 24, verse 7. You can see what's going on in a number of places, like when you read about over there in um, uh, uh, the book of Enoch, chapter 1 talks about this. Uh, Daniel, chapter 12, talks about this e these events. Um, I think it's Jubilees, chapter 26, that talks about these, you know, these end times when people will once again come in contact with the law and start keeping the law. And then we will start humanity as a whole will well, of, of course, it'll they'll, it'll be a while before they catch up. You know, it, it's going to take earthquakes and you know other stuff before they realize it. But for the people who are now embracing the law and making it a part of their life, you're starting to see a lot. What what is what is one of the definitions of the word rapture? It says a mystical experience in which the spirit is exalted to a knowledge of divine things well you know that's a lot what's taking place and you see that over there in the book of um 
Nehemiah in chapter 8. Let's jump back over there and look at that right quick. All of the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Jeshua, the son of Nun, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so. And there was very great gladness. See, like I said, these people are, are, are just now starting to keep the law again. And that's where we're at now. Um, you know, we've been in the church age, you know, the church age started back there in the year 312 with, uh, the emperor Constantine who had been slaughtering the disciples of Christ up until about October the 28th of 312 on that day decided that not only was he a Christian, but he decided that he was the head of the Christian church. And since he made it a rule for them to stop killing the disciples many of the disciples um put a little bit of faith in this guy and allow him to stand in as the head of the christian church he went on to have the council of nicaea or the council of trent where he canonized the bible you know that's where we get those 66 books from and you know even till this day people don't understand that, that there is well over 66 inspired writings it was just this pope constantine that truncated it down to that number uh trying to exclude any book that implicated him or you know this new catholic church that he was forming um, he tried to get rid of the book of Revelation, too. But, you know, since the council decided they was going to keep the book of Revelation in the Bible, that is to this day, while the Catholic Church doesn't really use the Bible for their doctrine. They have what they call encyclical writings or, you know, some other documents that they use that kind of try to avoid the Bible because it has the book of Revelation in there, which implicates them as the harlot church, implicates them as the uh, the uh, authors of this church age period that we're in well the thing about it one thing that Constantine did back then um, one significant thing he did back then was he did away with the statutes he made it um, difficult if if not deadly for them to actually keep the feast days, the holy days like unleavened bread and Pentecost and tabernacles and he replaced those feast days with his already ongoing pagan holidays. For instance, he replaced unleavened bread with Easter. You know, people wonder what does bunnies and eggs have to do with, with, you know, Passover, or whatever. It has nothing to do with those days. The feast of Easter goes way back even to the days of Solomon or whatever. That's what you know, got Solomon in trouble, you know, some of his thousands of wives and concubines there were, were worshiping that pagan God even back then. And Solomon built temples to those pagan gods. And, you know, that's why, you know, he ended up in a uh, very uh, bad state in there in the, in the day of his death or whatever. He, they basically made a clown out of him for worshiping Easter and those other gods. And, you know, uh, but Constantine went further, replacing Pentecost with, you know, Memorial Day or something like that. And he replaced uh, um, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles that we're talking about now with Christmas. You know, the Messiah was actually born during the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, some say it was the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which would have mean that he would have been circumcised on this eighth day that we're talking about here. But Constantine did away with that. That's what started this church age, this pagan period. That's what started it was when Constantine did away with all of that, um, those holy uh uh, um, convocations and replace them with pagan holidays. So instead of uh, celebrating the birth of the Messiah, who, like I said, would have been at the beginning of Tabernacles, we now celebrate the birth of Nimrod, which actually falls on December the 25th. So many of our father's people, at least those whose names is written in the book of life, are now finding these laws and are now embracing these laws and are now using these laws to, you know, 
uh, create what we know as the third temple, this third temple being dedicated on our hearts and our conscience. Um, of course, it, it has to go through these feast days. You look over there in Isaiah chapter 58. Let me jump over there and look at that. This is kind of the theme to our channel. So I jump over there. Um, it's one of the main things that we're talking about. Uh, Isaiah chapter 58 verse 12 says, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairers of the breach, the restorers of the paths to dwell in. This is, you know, one of the main things that we do on our channel. Um, we are the repairers of the breach. This breach is formed when we lost these feast days and don't know about keeping these feast days this like we talked about earlier is creating sin and it is creating separation between us and the father praise him and his infinite wisdom that he gave us 10 years to correct this stuff and that's the period that we end now it says um, that we will be called or our children will be called the restorers of the paths to dwell in. And these, these, uh, these paths to dwell in, they go through Leviticus 23. There's no way we're going to get back in touch with our father unless we start to keep these feast days. Even those people who teach the doctrine of liberty, you know, they plan it on being flying, flown away off the planet, you know, going into, you know, some other place. And, you know, they talk about how they're going to return uh, um, to earth one day. Well, um, what they're talking about is actually reincarnation. They're actually going to be born again as the children of those who survive the tribulation. And when they get back, guess what? They're going to keep the feast days. It is absolutely necessary. They may be in the doctrine of liberty now, you know, just, you know, counting on the day that they, you know, are removed from the planet or whatever. But, you know, even when they get back, these feast days are going to be waiting for them. This repeated over and over throughout the Old Testament of the Bible. That's pretty much sums up the story, how these children of Israel would find the law and things would go good and they'd lose the law and things would go bad. It just it was very cyclical. Um, well, let's look at verse 18. It says also day by day from the first day unto the last day, he read in the book of the law and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according to the manner. Now, this is important to understand during the Feast of Tabernacles, like we have established already, this is a temple building feast. It is all about our temple. When it when it's talking about tabernacles, the word tabernacle means tent. And just like the father had Moses to build him a tent that he could keep the mercy seat and the Holy of Holies in, um, well, uh, the tent of today for this third temple is actually going to be our flesh. Our flesh is the tabernacle. Well, as we are dedicating this tent, constructing this tent and building this tabernacle, building the third temple of the Lord, um, you see, one of the things that they did was they read out of the book of the law every day. For seven days, they read out of the book of the law. And that's one of the things that we should be doing now is actually reading Exodus chapter 20 through 24, verse 7. But anyway, I know I get a little bit preachy when it comes to the law, guys. Uh, I hope you're just feeling how important it is, you know. But let's let's go back in time a little bit and go back to the book of 1 Kings and chapter 8. We was just in Nehemiah talking about the second temple. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the dedication of the first temple. Now, when you... Looking at first Kings in chapter eight, you'll find it to be really, really interesting um, because of this prayer that Solomon gave at the dedication of the temple. Um, I've covered this in a in a class. I probably reference it somewhere down in the in the comment section or maybe at the end of this video. But you guys check out that class. It, it, I the title has something to do with praying towards the east or praying towards Jerusalem or something like that, because what we find in that chapter in that prayer is that um, Solomon was his his whole thing was that if we pray towards the temple, if we pray towards Jerusalem, that our prayers would be answered. 
Um, so it's some really, really interesting stuff. A lot of people, including myself, you know, when, you know, we find ourselves in need of, um, our prayers to be answered, um, right then, you know, with not just a generalized prayer, but, you know, we find ourselves in a little bit of trouble and we need our need, need our prayers to be answered. You know, myself, you know, I'll stand up, I'll turn towards the east, I'll raise my hands and I will say my prayer um, in that tribulous time because of what we read about over here in First uh, Kings in chapter eight. And you see it in Second Chronicles chapter six as well. But I pull out this one in chapter eight because it kind of ends over here in um, verse 66, which is talking about the eighth day celebration. Let me read right there. It says, um, on the eighth day, he sent the people away and they blessed the king and went unto their tents, joyful and glad of heart for all of the goodness that the Lord had done for David, his servant and for Israel, his people. So here you have, you know, them celebrating the eighth day. Eighth day celebration is when he's actually sending these people away, Mary and heart. This is the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, like we said, there will be a prophetic fulfillment to this day. It would involve years instead of days. You know, all of this tribulation and apocalypse and all of that stuff will be in the past. We'll actually, you know, be in a time when, you know, the trees will start growing back and, you know, people will start, you know, rebuilding and all of that kind of stuff that that's, that's number of years um, down the road, of course. But that whole year will actually be or involve this celebration type event. I hope you guys understand that the significance of these eighth day celebration. Now we can read the same story over in Second Chronicles uh, chapter seven and uh, verses eight and ten. Let me read verse eight. It says, "Also, at the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all of Israel with him, a very great congregation, from the entering of Hamath until the river Egypt. These people have built tents everywhere. They got them in the street. They got them on their houses. You know, and and this stuff is going on around the world now. It's just not so many of the father's people compared to the seven point five billion people that there are on the planet. So it doesn't seem like you know a lot going on. But you know." These, these it's, a, it's a lot of people people sleeping in cars um people sleeping on trampolines uh people have built you know tabernacles inside of their houses um this is it's a lot going on um even if you don't see it um verse 9 says and in the eighth day they made a solemn assembly for they kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days so and you know we read about that over there solomon had he had a 14 day jism of bob going over there i'm not sure i need to do some studying on that he actually said it probably did for uh 14 days now was it um uh, was the additional seven days before the Feast of Tabernacles or after the Feast of Tabernacles? I'd have to look that up. If you know, you know, put it down in the comment section. Help me out. You know, um, I learned from you guys, you know, just like you guys learned from me or whatever. Um, this is a collaborative effort and it, and it needs to be because our Father gives, you know, everybody bits and pieces of this puzzle so you guys you know if you if you know about that um 14 days that solomon celebrated put it down there in the comment section um but notice that this is dedication i, I bring you back to this guys again it's talking about dedication of the temple dedication of the first this is the first temple so you have dedication of the first temple and then over there with nehemiah we saw dedication of the second temple and then we understand now we are in the period where we are dedicating the third temple guys is is this this stuff is cyclical like we talked about uh let me read verse uh, 10 it says and on the three and twentieth day of the seventh month, he sent the people away into their tents, glad and merry of heart and of the goodness that the Lord has showed unto uh, David and to Solomon and to Israel, his people. So this is on the, the uh, 23rd day. This was actually be more like day nine or whatever. And we'll cover this in, a, in another class going forward. But, you know. Um, we're hoping you you get in the, the picture about this eighth day celebration. 
one thing about um, uh, Second Chronicles in chapter uh, seven, like we said, it's the same story that you read about over in First Kings in chapter eight. Whereas over there, you know, it started off talking about that prayer that Solomon said in First Kings in chapter eight, and then it went into the uh, tabernacling period and talking about the eighth day. Well, over here in Second Chronicles chapter seven. Um, you would actually have to hear about that prayer in chapter six. But in chapter seven, he talks about the tabernacling period and the eighth day celebration. And then it goes on to talk about how the Lord appeared. Our father, our heavenly father appeared to King Solomon again. And, you know, so this is some some stuff to 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 read about, too. You know, add this to you guys reading list. You know, after this video, go go listen to it or read it. Um, uh, chapter uh, seven of Second Chronicles and chapter eight of First Kings. You know, it's a lot of important stuff going on in these chapters, guys. You know, with these prayers and these visitations, um, and such. So, you know, add those to your reading list. But of course, remember that Exodus chapter twenty through twenty-four, verse seven, is on your reading list as well. I know we covered a lot in this video, but, you know, praise the Lord. Our father is increasing the knowledge, you know, on, you know, he's given us a lot of stuff to talk about, you know, and, you know, I, I know I'm not special at all. I know he's not giving me, you know, this knowledge just for me to sit around and, you know, act like I'm smart or whatever. If he's giving it to me, you know, same way if he used to give me wealth or whatever, it would be to share with others. But I hope you guys are getting the importance of this tabernacling, this third temple, this law and all of this stuff and how it all relates to one another. Um, this is a, some very important times that we are in now. Remember, we are still in the 10 days of all. So you do have next year. You do have the feast of Passover. You know, it's not over. You really ain't missed that yet. You know, I can remind you guys of the parable of the laborers where those individuals who showed up with only an hour left of of uh, work to do still got the same pay as those individuals who have been working for 12 days or for 12 hours so you know as people who've been serving the lord for 12 years or 24 years you know you guys who have been serving for 24 hours are going to get the same pay it's all about getting into the law it's all about doing what we you know are supposed to be doing down here um, and so, you know, don't think you're late or whatever. Like I said, we're in 10 days, 10 years of, of repentance. So we do have some time left. Um, well, I'm gonna go ahead and close it out here, guys. Um, if you got something out of this video, hit the like button. If you didn't go ahead and hit the dislike button, but leave us a comment either way and shalom.